Yeah. Serving Satan. And uh, through the power of the gospel, he was miraculously saved back in 1972. He'd been serving the Lord since. And there's, uh, under many dangers, many obstacles, has a real testimony of the power of God. He also has an insight into the other side that many of us just do not know, we're not aware of. And many of the things that we take for granted and assume to be harmless are really tools of the devil. And so I'm just going to let Brother Todd come and share with us these things that God has laid on his heart. All right. Uh, I understand that many parents from the school here have been calling the principal with questions about what all took place the other night. Uh, I'm sure that teenagers can uh, tell it one way different than it happened, but uh, the report seemed to be very good. I'm glad that I did, was able, with the testimony that I gave the other day, to touch many of the teenagers' hearts. Uh, I'm sorry that I won't be here for the fun on Tuesday, which is destroying the record. I got kind of a little, you know, something like a Tonka blast last night. I got to break up a bunch of Kiss records. Now, uh, that may seem kind of strange for you. What kind of nut gets thrills from breaking up Kiss records? Same kind of nut that gets the same thrills from burning J.R.R. token books and breaking up Ouija boards. But uh, I came out of a world, which I'll explain in about in a few minutes, where these aren't innocent little things. And whether they be in the Christian world or in the witchcraft world, they're still not innocent. They're very dangerous. And they're carefully laid traps to entrap people that the occult has spent millions and millions of dollars to devise. Before I give my testimony, I want to say something real quick. Most people have a kind of elusive idea of what the occult world is, and they miss the whole point of the occult world. It is not just something where witches get together, and there are real creatures or whatever called witches around. Uh, it is not a place where people get together and hold seances and float tables all the time and so on. The occult world is a very political and financial world where some of the most influential people in the world today believe that Lucifer is God and the only answer to the world's problems, and they trust the people in witchcraft to be their ministers, and they are just members of the church. I'm going to be talking about an organization called the Illuminati today, so I might as well get that organization out of the way now. Then many people have discovered the Illuminati in different phases of life, 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 whatever, across the United States. My pastor first discovered them, Dr. Rasmussen, when he dealt with the Masonic Lodges. Other people have discovered them in the form of the Catholic Church and in the occult world and the political world and international banking system and many other types of conspiracies that existed. And when they discovered it without knowing any more about it, they thought that's exactly what the Illuminati was, and they ran off and wrote a book on the Illuminati saying this is where it was at. When I came out of witchcraft, I had dealt enough with the Illuminati to know that witchcraft wasn't the total Illuminati. Witchcraft and the Satanist Church and the Spiritualist Church and other things, when they're combined together in higher levels, in lower levels, they're all scattered here and there. They resemble much like the Christian Church. They're always arguing amongst themselves. But in higher levels, they're one. And the ministers that are in the higher levels are like the pastor here. He's the pastor, and you're the congregation. You're supposed to be Christian. Most of you are. But you're also mechanics, construction, white-collar businessmen, and so on. Well, in the Illuminati, it's the same way. There are bankers, there are politicians, there are ministers, and so on. But their ministers are the people in higher levels of witchcraft. And I was born into a family that helped create the Illuminati, the Collins family. They were selected just all probably close to 100 years before, over 100 years actually, before the Illuminati became, per se, the Illuminati. They brought witchcraft to the United States. Many of the people that they chose to be their ministers are very famous in the early revolution history of America. I mention names across the United States, and people say, oh, no, those were good God fearing men. And then I start quoting from newspapers in Boston and reports around the revolutionary times where this man was caught doing this and this man was caught doing that. And all of a sudden, they don't look too much like three of our most important legendary figures that helped our country be birthed were arrested at one time for human sacrifice and the charges were dismissed. They had the body, everything. The building they were in doing the right one night caught fire. A bunch of people perished and they got arrested and so on. And they kind of got out of the charge. You know how it is with important figures. Still had a little pull back then. But this is the world as it really exists and we're going to be talking about it today. You may think that it's uh, a little different from anything you've ever heard and I must either be crazy or lying or I've got a good story or something. And the reason for that 
is that you sat in front of your television quite a lot, or a lot of most people do, and the television has a very absorbing nature upon people. You begin to accept that what you see on television is reality, and that's the way people are. Across the country, we've named people that are in the occult world that are also on television. Told, in fact, a couple of people I know that I used to have a lot of dealings with when I was in the witchcraft world that are now superstars on TV. And you can't, most people can't accept that because they watch them and these are nice, you know, clean cut figures. Surely from their television shows, that's just the way they are. But it's not so. In fact, just to kind of break the ground, I'll give you an example before I go with the testimony. One of the most powerful witches in the United States is on television. She's a homosexual. In fact, the young lady she lives with in marriage is a very famous rock star. And they thought it was very unjust of witchcraft that homosexuals weren't allowed to be ministers in witchcraft. I think they were smarter than the Christian church. <laughs> but, uh, so they decided that that was unfair. So they formed their own denomination, or as we call it in witchcraft, a brotherhood, for witches and for homosexuals that are witches. Now this nice, clean-cut American girl has one of the top comedy, situation comedies on television. Most people watch it on Tuesday night when they don't have anything else to do, like pray. It's called Laverne and Shirley, and the girl's name is Cindy Williams that plays Shirley. Now, that's the real world out there. It's not the world that you see on television. So today, if I say a few things that are astonishing to you, I say these things across the country, and so many people have looked at these poor people with tapes till they're running out of their ears of, of these things I've said. I have ended up in court because usually I quote actual news releases and statements made to the public that most other people don't catch, or I quote knowledge in the past that I can prove. So believe me, I get up here and I say the things that can be proven, and uh, I'm very careful what I say. So you think about it for a while. At least do this. Most people that hear me that can't accept me decide they're going to go prove I'm wrong because they can't stand what I said. It just will shatter their lives, I hope. And so they run out and they go to all the libraries and they try to prove against what I say. Then I get my strongest believers after that. Because when you go to the library and you go to the book stands and you start buying books and you start researching the things I'm going to say today, something very mysteriously happens. You find out I'm telling the truth. It's all there. So I invite you to go spend a few hours, turn off the television, and do some prayer and do some reading of the Word of God and do some reading of other books when you leave here today. And you might find out what's really, really happening today. And I came from a family, as I said, the Collins family, that brought witchcraft to the United States. They were originally Druids in Scotland. Their name was Colleen. And they had to flee to Scotland because of being hunted for witchcraft. And they came down to England and pretended to be a Puritan family. One thing I want to point out over and over today is that there are many this is communist trained KGB agents to come to the United States and infiltrate into political and religious circles. So does the occult world. They have a whole training center, two of them in fact, one in St. Louis and one in St. Paul, that completely trains the witch in how to act and talk like a Christian. And they usually do it better than we do because they're pretending and we're stumbling. So just going to point this out as we go today. But they went down and they pretended to be Puritans, and they came overseas. In fact, they brought the first Puritans to the United States on board the ship that Francis Collins owned. They landed at an area called Collins Bay outside of Salem. And it's, in fact, that's why it's called Collins Bay. Now, many of you, how many of you, excuse me, remember a show called Dark Shadows? Okay? You can guess who that was about. When I was a teenager, I was asked to, at all expense paid, fly out to Hollywood with the diary that I had inherited as a child through a will from my great-grandmother. And they were the diaries of several members of the Collins family. One of them was a character named France Williams Collins, which was the secretary in a coven that Benjamin Franklin was a high priest of. And the diary dealt great heavily with three political figures, Jefferson, Franklin, and Hamilton. You can call them by name in the diary and so on. And this is the man that they copied the character Barnabas Collins from in the show. And uh, I was out there for a few months during my summer vacation one year, telling all about the Collins family as they were putting the scripts together. That was a very interesting thing that happened to the show. It had the highest ratings of any show that's ever been on television, and it was literally prayed off the television. 
It still had the high ratings when they quit, but for no understandable reason, they just quit producing the show. And it's, they still haven't figured out why they've done it. In fact, they've tried to bring it back several times and repeats across the country, and every time it's arose, as repeats, Christians have started praying, and it's only lasted two or three weeks and went off the television again. So if it happens to come up in this area, you might decide praying a little. It was a very, very strong occult show, probably besides Bewitched was the main reason that the occult grew as strong as it grew so quickly, other than rock music. <laughs> now, I was raised, born and raised in this family, which automatically placed me into a witchcraft atmosphere. Many of you have known nothing but Christianity. Many of you have came out of the world or are Christians, and many of you are still in the world, which I hope you'll get out of today after hearing this. But I was born into a witchcraft family, and as I was telling some of the teenagers different places, when the kids were coming to Sunday school and memorizing memory verses, I was memorizing the witches' chant. When they were reading stories of Moses, Moses and Joseph and so on, and the disciples and the Gospels, I was reading J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. When they were studying different things and uh, they were learning the Lord's uh, about the Lord's Supper, I was learning how flying saucers brought the first men to the earth. When they were learning about the garden and Adam and Eve, I was learning about Adam and Eve being the sons of God. So it was a little different. And of course, when they were learning how to pray, I was learning how to light candles and incense and cast spells. And I grew up in this atmosphere. Many of the kids had something I never had that I never missed until I became a Christian and realized it really existed. Now I miss it. I never had a childhood. In witchcraft, the parents are not allowed. And even if they could, they wouldn't have the ability to. They're not allowed to love their children. The children are the property of the craft and not of the parents. They are raised by all the witches in the craft, and the parents say nothing. One thing you might be interested to know is they're never allowed to spank their children. They're never allowed to punish them. From the moment the child is five years old, he's considered an adult, and he's treated like an adult. And therefore, you have some very rebellious children. But that's the way they like it. Now, when I was 13, I was taken to a thing called the outer court. And the outer court is a school, like you might send your child to a specific coast Bible college. Only each coven has their own Bible college, and it's called the outer court. And there I was trained to be a priest in witchcraft. And at 14, I was initiated a priest. Now, if that seems young for you, you can imagine at 13 or 14, you fish your own child, and that's the way it was. I have a little bit of news for you. My sister progressed even faster than I did. When she was 13, she was the witch queen of the state of Ohio. She had over, close to, about 15,000 witches under her direct control, and all of them were almost adults. So age has nothing to do with it. This is how fast they were trained and the family they came from. In fact, they're after teenagers. The 95% of the people who join witchcraft are inducted by their school teachers in junior high and high school. So if you're sitting out there and you don't, in the past, I've been asking to say, this is just a firm belief of mine, if you don't have them in a Christian school, I suggest you get them in a Christian school. Real quick. My wife's not here today because tomorrow is the opening day of our rehabilitation center, something we've prayed for five and a half years to have, and she moved all night to about four or five this morning, some of the people from the church I just called, and they had just now, were going to have to miss Sunday school because they were so sleepy, they've been up for over 24 hours moving and getting the center ready, so it'll be ready tomorrow. But her testimony is that two people started her in witchcraft, her pastor and her drama teacher in junior high school. So uh, that'll give you kind of a deal what the occult is like. She was inducted when she was a freshman in school. She wasn't born into a family. But when I was raised... You had to be a witch to be in witchcraft, and then it started changing because they wanted the numbers. Now, at 18, I was initiated a high priest. When I was 14 and initiated a priest, that made me draft exempt from military service because all of the brotherhoods of witchcraft and the Satanic Brotherhood of America, which is the Satanist Church, are federal recognized churches. It might interest you to know that some of your tax money pays for a chaplain in every federal prison in the United States, a chaplain of the Witchcraft Church. They have an altar and a service every Sunday for all the witches in the federal prison. And your taxes pay for the chaplain and all the instruments that he uses during the service. Nice to know, huh? But, uh, in fact, I got started at Folsom and San Quentin were the first two prisons to do it. 
and Fulton's estate prison, so some of your state taxes are going to it, too. That was Jerry Brown's idea. You might consider that when you vote for him next time. Now, you know, they're not publishing that on the television commercial when they say all he's done having. Anyway, at 18, I was initiated to high priest, but at 19, I decided that the military needed us. They needed witchcraft. Whether they knew it or not, we were there to answer to the world's problems. So I decided that I was going to enlist, and I rode around the country to all the other uh, high priestesses and high priests that I knew, and I suggested the idea to them, and they thought it was a good idea. So we all ran off and enlisted in service and went in. Had I couldn't do anything halfway, which is have a tendency of never doing anything halfway. I guess that's why I don't do anything halfway as a Christian now. So if I say something that you think, well, that's too strong for a Christian, you got to understand that I came out of a thing where I didn't hold anything back to the devil, and I'm sure not going to hold anything back to the Lord. But I went in, enlisted in the Special Forces, went to Vietnam, came back, came back medically wounded. In fact, for a while I didn't think I was going to live, and if I was going to live, I was going to lose my eyes and this leg. But I came through the situation. I really feel that the Lord had his hand on me at that time. And I re-enlisted when my time was up and went back into the service immediately without even, you know, just getting the discharge and, and the same minute taking the oath to go back in. And I went to Germany. When I arrived in Germany, I had six years I had just re-enlisted for. I took one month of leave and I spent once in Germany. One night while drinking in the month of June of 1970, I was drinking quite heavily and taking drugs. I got in an argument with an officer in downtown Stuttgart, and I shot and killed the officer. Now, the Army does not appreciate sergeants shooting officers. They have a way of dealing with that. And they locked me quickly up in solitary confinement, started court-martial proceedings, and Leavenworth was looking like my next home for good. Now, until this time, witchcraft was a religion to me. That's all it was. I knew there were several brotherhoods that were big witches, but... They couldn't have been any bigger than actually I was because I was third level and that's as high as you could go. And, and everybody knew that your power was, the, you were a god in yourself because of your SP and psychic powers. But there were pagan gods that we worshipped also, multi-gods. And that was all there was until this moment. And I decided that I needed some help. I knew witches were very powerful and it hadn't been the first time that witches had cast spells on judges and juries to make them vote a certain way. So I sent word out to a prisoner being released to call my foster mother in Los Angeles. I asked him to have her get a bunch of the big witches together and cast spells on the three judges that were going to finish giving the verdict, make them think I was a good guy, and it was all a mistake, and the officer was probably the bad guy and let me go. Now that's what I thought would happen, except that three days later, after the phone call, my cell door opened. The next day I was to go get the verdict, and my cell door opened, and I walked out. They called me out into the corridor. There stood two men I'd never seen before, but I found out quickly that one was named Senator Saxby and another one was named Carm Congressman Wiley. Now, Saxby, as you know, later became our Attorney General. He was the man responsible for keeping law and order in the United States, and he just was breaking the law because he handed me an honorable discharge. There was a couple of generals standing there with him, he, and the honorable discharge reads, Honorable discharge. It doesn't explain what I'm going to do with the rest of the six years of my service, and it doesn't say why I'm getting out. It just says honorable discharge, just like anybody else that would have completed all their service. He further told me that my court martial records had been shredded, that as far as the military was concerned, the court martial never took place, and that I had nothing to worry about because all the testimony had been shredded, and that the people who had testified had been ordered to forget the whole thing, and many of them were at that moment receiving orders to go to Vietnam. And at the same time, I was told not to worry about it, that my military records would be destroyed later. It was interesting, when the fire swept through the record center at St. Louis, only the Korean and World War II records were supposed to have been destroyed. But mine was Vietnam records, and mine was destroyed in the fire. So, anyway, I flew back on the military plane to Fort Dix, got everything together, and went home to Ohio, arrived very confused. Arrived at my, I have two mothers, a mother and a foster mother. I arrived at my mother's home. I said, look, you've been in this witchcraft thing a long time. What type of spell makes senators and generals do what we want? She says, you don't understand, do you? That wasn't a spell. They're with us. She handed me an envelope and said, this is for you. I opened it with $2,000 and $100 bills. 
on a first class plane ticket to New York City. I said, what's this for? She said, you make a phone call, you get the next plane you can out of here, and I'll make a phone call and tell them that you're coming, they'll meet you at the airport. I said, who are you going to call that's going to meet me at the airport? She says, you'll know when you get there. Now, witches are very curious people, that's why they always get in trouble. I just couldn't wait to find out who's going to meet me at the airport. I mean, I had $2,000. I could catch the best plane in the world back if I didn't like it. Besides, $2,000, that was a lot of money. I had to find out who could flash this type of money around. So I got on the plane, flew there, got off the plane, and a man whose books I had studied for a long time walked up and met me. He was head of the anthropology department at Columbia University at that time. He is now he's the president of his own witchcraft Bible college in New Hampshire. His name was Dr. Raymond Buckman handpicked by Philip Rothschild to lead the Illuminati for him. And I arrived there, got off the plane, Dr. Buckman took me to his home, and the next few months he literally tore down everything that I had been taught in witchcraft, that it was all just the stuff we told the lower people. Much like the Masons, the higher Masons believe one way, and the lower Masons believe something else. But the lower Masons think the higher Masons believe like them. In fact, the higher witches have said a statement that was also made many times in the Sonic book that the lower people are sheep to be sheared in their ignorance. So that's how they think of the lower witches that we have in here, here today. And there was one thing that I did learn very quickly was that witchcraft just wasn't witchcraft, that it had a goal. And that goal was to return Adam, or the Son of God, to the earth to create peace so that his father, Lucifer, could return to the earth. So that's the gospel of the witches. And that was their purpose, and that's what the Illuminati meant, the light bearers, to bear the torch for Lucifer. We learned all this, we learned all the things that, I learned all the things that politics had done so far, the Illuminati had done in politics, had done in finance, and what their plans were for the immediate future. And then I was taken up to Colorado, and I was placed to an initiation at a place called the Summit Monastery. Now, the Church Universal Triumphant, or Summit International, holds its main Bible college in Pasadena. They bought the old Nazarene College there. They used to be called the Process, and the Process still exists out on the East Coast. Manson was a member of the Process. That kind of gives you an idea of what they're like. Very racist-type group, American Nazi-type group, but they believe in human sacrifice and Lucifer being God. They believe that peace will only be achieved when the Christians, when the churches are burnt, as one leader said, Isaac Bonowitz said, when the churches are in ashes, and the Christians are against the wall, then our God will give us peace. I imagine that's when their God would give them peace. But, anyway, after all this training, this initiation, I moved down to San Antonio so I could direct, direct the drug traffic coming across the border there in three places, and a couple places in Arizona. I was given a 13-state area and all the occult activities in those 13 states. I didn't have California. My foster mother leads California. So, but I had a lot of dealings because of her in California in the occult. Now, my only job was to meet eight times a year with the top witches around the country to decide things that would happen. Right now, today, is one of the days that the witches meet eight times a year. This is New Year's Eve to witches. This is Beltane, the most important day in witchcraft. Now, a very strange thing has been taking place. Instead of a one-day meeting, which was scheduled, those 13 witches and several hundred others have been meeting in Los Angeles for the past three weeks. Must be very important what they're going to be up to. But anyway, if you always wondered why the birthday of the Illuminati and the birthday of the Communist Party is May 1st, that's because the Illuminati always uses May 1st, because that's New Year's Day, and they begin everything on May 1st. So you can always watch for big things happening on May 1st. But I lived there for a while. The other thing that I did, as I told the young people here before, was to pass out money. I would receive checks starting at about a half a million dollar figure and working up cashier's checks from three main banks in New York City would come by Harm Messenger. It would be my job to place them in people's hands. Now, most of the people that received these were in the charismatic movement. That's why I don't like the charismatic movement. I don't know why some of the Baptists don't like it, <clears throat> but I know why I don't like it. I don't like it because I had to pay most of its leaders off. And we bought most of the big churches that are charismatic churches today, like Melody Land and Calvary Chapel. That's why I don't like it. The occult world does not spend money to their enemies. They give it to their friends. So you might consider that 
if it ever crosses your path or if it has. So that was mainly my function. And then one thing happened that changed it all. I was slowly getting dissatisfied with this thing because it wasn't the religion that I had been raised in any longer. It was politics. It was conspiracy all the time. It was this devious act and that devious act. And then that just wasn't what I had been promised when I started becoming a priest at 14. But you can't get out when you get in, supposedly, at least. Nobody had ever heard of getting out at that time. And then August the 1st happens, 1972. A courier from our State Department, from the London Embassy, arrived in San Antonio, where I was hosting the meeting on, it was called Latimer, August the 1st. All the witches, the 13, were gathered together there. The courier came in and left the sealed pouch with the uh, Secretary of State seal on it and left. Dr. Buckland cut the seal and opened it and took out six letters which bore the crest of the Illuminati. The crest of the, of the Illuminati is on the back of your one dollar bill. The capstone in the pyramid with the eye in the capstone. Opened the letters and both of them were instructions to give this check to this person or tell this politician to get this bill passed or do something or other. The last two were totally different from anything we'd seen. They were in Philip Rothschild's own handwriting. Now, according to the doctrine of Wicca, of pagan movements, if you're going to write something that is religious, something from the gods, it must be written in your own handwriting with a dip pen. And both these letters were. The first one was 30 pages long. It was a step-by-step chart for the taking over of the world. As strange as that may seem to you, it was there in black and white. An eight-year plan. And it closed with... Lucifer will give up the world at the end of the year that begins the age of Aquarius. In plain old-fashioned talk, that's December 1980. So that's why I call the thing about the age of Aquarius. Now, after all this, and by the way, I've been watching that plan very carefully over the years. They're right on schedule. In fact, they're a little bit ahead of schedule. And then one more letter came out, a sixth letter. I guess that's why they waited and, and labeled it number six. Talked about Adam. All the witches went into a hoot and a holler and started praising Lucifer and so on and so forth. I just kind of sat back in shock because it said, we have found Adam and Adam will lead us in peace. In Christian terms, brothers and sisters, they found the Antichrist. Little Prophet Shot says, we will spend every dollar we have, which is most all the dollars in the world. We will cause as many wars and we will destroy as many governments as it takes to put him on the throne of peace so that his father can return in the age of Aquarius. Now that's when it was time to get out. I don't know about you or you would have thought to do at that time, but I wanted out. So these people were serious. I didn't really think they could do it. I'd been there all this time on the top council and I just then realized I thought they were joking the whole time. That it was just a game so they could spend money. You can't get out. Other people have tried to get out. It was just impossible to get out. The next month I went through in total depression, stayed on drugs. I was doing $150 a day worth of crystal. One guy was talking to one of my brothers yesterday. I showed him the scars on my arm from the needle mark that it never went away. And just down to about 149 pounds, just existing. In a constant state of paranoia, which the drug produced anyway. And slowly, I just kind of gave up, said, well, it won't be long. They'll either get dissatisfied with me or I'll take an overdose some night or, or something will happen, and that'll be it. Get away from all these crazy people. I'll come back in another life and start all over again when it's more sensible. The only problem was the Lord had other plans. It wasn't a problem except for the devil. I'm glad he did because a Baptist minister in town had found his daughter, an initiated witch. And that's when his teaching at Baylor University didn't work anymore, that witches were fatal. And he started praying, he started reading the Word of God, and found out that all through the Old and New Testament, witches existed. He found out that in Babylon, that was the religion. And he found out in Revelation, it would be the religion again. He found in the 16th chapter of Acts, 16, 17, 18, 19, that the power of a witchcraft was the ordering of the demons in the name of Jesus out of the person. And that we had the victory through the form of God over the devil. And slowly, first, he didn't believe in witches. And then he believed in me and got afraid of them. Then he realized that being afraid of a witch was being afraid of the devil. And that was ridiculous. So he came looking in prayer and fasting 
for the head witches around the area. And I was very well known in the area as being very involved in witchcraft. And he prayed, God, let my camp cross his. Now, my occult name, the name that I was sprinkle baptized, that's where you get your sprinkle baptism from, a name I was sprinkle baptized with was Lance Collins when I was initiated a priest. They sprinkle baptized me and made me a new person, supposedly. I walked out of there, Lance Collins, from the initiation, so that's the name that, while well, Lance, and then I attacked my family's name of Collins on it. So he went looking for Lance Collins. But something mysterious had happened. The guy was running one of our occult stores that had an overdose that night, and the cashiers were banging on my apartment door telling me to let him in or get something done, and I came down and let him in, and just as I was leaving, he walked in. Now, I knew he was a Baptist the moment he came up. He was carrying this big, black Thompson chain reference. Now, that's the way they go around in southern Texas. They believe in showing the sword. As one Baptist preacher told me, if I can't cut him with it, I'll beat him over the head with it. <laughs> but he came in. He says, I'm looking for Lance Collins. And I go, oh, boy. And I said, I'm Lance Collins, but don't you start preaching at me. I don't want to hear it. I've got the light, and you're in darkness, and you don't know where you're at. And he started preaching to me, and I started cussing at him. And about five minutes of this screaming and hollering on my part, his preaching on his part, he stopped and said, okay. And I stopped and I go, oh, you're going to quit now, you're going to leave. He says, no, I'm going to take the authority over the devil on you. He says, and I ordered the demon in you to be silent. And I started cussing, and he said that, and I shut up like that. I had myself convinced, boy, it's that weird, I want to hear what he's saying. But I couldn't say anything. I just stood there dumbfounded because he had taken the authority over the real power in Lance Collins. The person that did the thing was a shell, and the directing force in him was the demon of the devil. Now that's the difference between Christians. We need to get a few possessed by the Spirit of God to where Jesus is so Lord of their life. They're the shell, and the directing force in their life is Jesus Christ. I sit there and I listen to the man as he pleaded the blood of Jesus Christ over me and he said, I demand in the name of Jesus, I command in the name of Jesus that the devil never give you one more benefit till you come to grips with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that includes his drugs that he's giving you. And he turned around, picked up his Bible, and left. I'm standing there, huh. Anybody knows the devil's a boogeyman the Christians created. See, witches don't believe in the devil, just the Satanists. That's the difference between witches and Satan. And I walked on upstairs, very shaken, trying to kid myself. That guy was crazy the whole time, like you're trying to do with me right now. And I picked up my needle, got it all warmed up and stuff, gave myself another fix and used up the last of the crystal that I had because I had sent everything off the night before. Because I had a huge drug shipment coming in that night across the Laredo border. No reason to worry. Man, that drugs would keep me going and, and most of the witches in the United States for the next six months. Once it was cut, put on the street, not to worry about it, ordered the drugs not to come to me. I mean, we had the border patrol paid off. I mean, that was a large shipment. We could afford it. Everything was set up. Nothing could go wrong. Except that there were some illegal aliens going across the border that night. And the two border patrol that we had paid off were removed for a stakeout. And a reservist was put on. And when this big car pulled up, and the idiot that was driving it just set three big cartons of the white powder in the back of the seat in plain sight, pulled up to the border, and got pulled out his gun and arrested him. I mean, what would you do? And there went the drug. So the phone rang about midnight. I was told this, and after getting calmed down and everything about it, it started hitting me. Hey, I ain't got anything here. So all night long, I was calling around trying to find drugs, and finally I worked the phone calls up to the state of Ohio. They said, yeah, no problem. We can get you some back down from the same stuff you sent up here. It'll be back down in your hands in the morning. I was doing three fixes a day. Tuesday morning was a couple of days away. That was just a little too long for me. But as Monday night went around, and I was so far into withdrawal that I thought I was actually dead but couldn't die, and I got in my car about 10 o'clock at night, tried to drive my car out of the parking lot to go find something to calm me down. I wrecked the car trying to get it out of the parking lot. I just walked off, left the car, went walking down the street, came upon a movie theater. The movie theater was called the Aztec Theater. I walked into the theater, paid my money, walked in, sat down about three rows back, going to get my mind right into the movie. You know, like you do 
when your wife is screaming at you and you turn on the stars and touch, you know, something like that. Or when the wife turns on the soap operas to get rid of all the kids and, and the worries of the bills and stuff. I sit there and watch the movie and the weirdest thing happened, this idiot came out waving his Bible all over the place, the flash bulbs were popping. The movie was called The Cross and the Switch Place. <laughs> and I sat there, at first I was really mad. Stop and I said, oh, I wasted all that money. And I said, well, I got no place to go. I must have sat here. And I got intrigued with the part of Nikki Cruz. And I must have made everybody in that movie sitter mad. Because I, I really got intrigued with Nikki. He was my type of guy, you know. And they woke us and go around witnessing to him. And I said, get away from here, preacher. Leave him alone. Don't you dumb Christian know he knows more than you do. And just scream at me. Like, Boy, I bet you. <laughs> but the ushers wouldn't touch me because they knew who I was. They were, you know, just wouldn't. Have anything, you know, I'm sure everybody ran out and said, get him out of here. And he said, not me. But I sat there, I went to the movie, and something that changed my whole life took place. Nikki Cruz got saved. Well, that's all right. I mean, the Masons talk about being born again, and the witches talk about being born again. I guess the Christians can talk about being born again. But something that doesn't take place at the other two incidences happened with Nikki. He changed. Now listen to me. I don't, I uh, guess I'm old, stick in the mud, or something. My heroes are Charles Finney and Billy Sunday and people like that. We need a few heroes in the world today. And I believe, like they believe, that if you give your heart to the Lord and you're truly born again, it's not because you say you're born again or because you walked up front. It's because there is a distinct turnaround change in your life. You're not the same person that walked down the aisle. And if you are, when the altar call is given today, you might consider doing it again. I don't want to take your salvation away from you, but I don't want to give you any false hope either. The judgment's too close and too important. And I believe that when you give your heart to the Lord and you repent, you're a different creature. You're not the same person. And Nikki Cruz changed in that picture. And according to astrology, and as I told people last night at a youth rally, there's three things required to cast a spell. Herbs. Jewelry and talismans, which we'll talk about in a minute, and astrology. And you can't cast spells without astrology. That's why astrology was invented. And according to the doctrine of astrology, you are a set sign, a set personality. You are born that way, you are destined that way, and nothing you're going to do is going to change your personality. Except Nikki's changed. And as the movie ended and I got up and walked out of there, it just had destroyed every doctrine that I had ever learned. I walked out of there and I said, boy, these Christians are weird. I tried to convince myself, that couldn't have really took place. Because I'd never seen any Christians that acted like they were Christians except the guy who walked in it, and I couldn't get him out of my mind either. I walked out, and I was about to meet my third Christian. He walked up, all the people were walking out, he said, he, I talked to him later, he didn't know who I was, he just felt directed to do it. He walked up and he handed me a track. I was the only one he handed one to. He didn't say anything. He said, here, this is specially for you. Turned around and walked off. That was the end of it. It was special for me, too. It was called Bewitched. Could have handed me a better one. I wasn't looking through it. Probably 90% at that time struck me as being real, but I discarded it because it said that the devil was real, and I just couldn't believe the devil was real. So I threw the track away and went on back. Started to go to my apartment, decided to go into one of our nightclubs down below in Sid called the Club Aquarius. And went, well, I mean, what else would you call a witchcraft club? You know, Club Aquarius. Walked in the back, locked the manager's office, and sat down by myself and started thinking things out. I wanted to talk with a Christian and find out if what they believed was the same things I had been taught they believed, which is a world of difference. The only problem is that we had paid and bribed and blackmailed so many ministers in the area that I didn't know who we could call. Because if I got a hold of the wrong one, I could end up getting killed. Because they'd report me. So I sat for a while and I thought it over. And finally I remembered that the night before, one of the witches had come in complaining about a coffee house called the Green Gate Club. Now this coffee house is a very, very strange place. It's been a burlesque parlor. So a minister went in one night, jumped up on the bar and shut the strippers off. He wasn't too polite about it. He shouldn't get polite with the devil started preaching the gospel. About 15 minutes later, the strippers had pulled the curtains down off the wall and wrapped them around their bodies and were kneeling down in front of the bar, giving their heart with the Lord. 
along with half of the customers, the men and women that owned the place, the band, and the bartenders. About 30 people saved in 15 of a good old-fashioned revival. Now, the people's lives were so changed that they gave the deed to the place to one of the Baptist churches. One of them that was praying and fasting that Lance Collins would get saved. It was all shaping up. But I didn't know that. All I knew was that this witch that was a prostitute had come in screaming at the top of her lungs when I was going through a draw and wasn't interested in hearing it. Bought this place down the street. How she tried a proposition and sold her down by the bus station. Here they wouldn't be preaching the word of God at them at the same time. It's a bankrupt you. It really puts you out of business. She was very unhappy about it. 